Ernst Kutzer was born into a prosperous family in 1880 in Burmish Lipa, which is now in the Czech Republic, but was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. At 18, he moved to Vienna in 1899 to attend the city's Academy of Fine Arts. But even as a student, he set up his own studio and within a year was picking up commercial clients. Initially it was poster work and general graphics which came his way, and he also created themed sets of postcards. But in 1910 he began to illustrate books for children, and among the first and most distinctive was that year's De Puppenswerk, written by Adolf Holst. And it was this book which effectively launched Kutz's career as a children's illustrator. In 1913 he collaborated again with Holst on the book Hans Wundersam, and this book provided yet more evidence that the partnership produced popular results, and they created many others in the ensuing years. Engaging as it was, there was nothing out of the ordinary about Kutzer's technical approach, but he had a descriptive calligraphic line style, and when in colour he simply added washes which were sometimes flat and sometimes tonal, but always with aesthetic purpose. In the years following the Great War he became increasingly prolific and alongside his continued success illustrating Adolf Holst verses, he wrote and illustrated some of his own and he even found time for other productive partnerships. One of these was with the writer Annelise Umlauf Lamach and together they created a number of very successful storybooks including Molly the Snowman. At this point, Kutzer was arguably the most successful children's illustrator in Austria, and between 1926 and 1930, other writers, including Albert Sixtus, were keen to have him decorate their texts. But during the Second World War, demand for such frivolous images fell dramatically, and it was a couple of years after the war had ended before he really got going again. Although he never managed to attain the same level of popularity he'd enjoyed between the wars, he nevertheless kept in regular work, with more books for children, and among other projects he had late success with some particularly charming watercolours for Hilda Forster's tale of Puck Earl and Muck Earl. And after a career in illustration lasting half a century, Ernst Kutzer died in Vienna in 1965 at the age of 85. Somehow I managed to completely miss Dutch illustrator Leo Jordan when I made my war propaganda videos, so hopefully this will compensate for that oversight. He was born in Amsterdam in 1885 and at 18 went to study at the National Academy for Fine Arts. Not long after he'd completed his studies, he began creating political cartoons for magazines, most of them Dutch, but from 1904 he also had work published in the German socialist magazine De Waar Jakob and he appeared most frequently in the pages of the satirical magazine De Nottenkracker from 1909 through to 1927. Early on his stylistic approach was eclectic and ranged from compelling energetic pen and ink hatching techniques through to bolder graphic work. During the Great War Holland stayed neutral and consequently little of his work dealt with the subject and he continued to use a variety of styles for his satires of domestic politics in magazines and poster work well into the 1920s. Virtually every image he created at this time was black and white, although in the case of some posters he was able to create painted colour images on occasion. But in 1928 he took a job with de Groene Amsterdamer and significantly his tenure there coincided with the rise of Hitler's National Socialists in Germany and Jordan, who was staunchly opposed to all they stood for, started using his graphic skills to eloquently express his animosity towards them. And seemingly out of the blue, for this body of vitriolic images, he started using a more formal and precise line, with particularly regular ink shading, frequently created as stippling, which gave the images graphic impact and plausible solidity. Although they were created by Jordan as pure monochrome line illustration, they were almost invariably printed with a flat secondary colour. And in the decade leading up to the war, he created a large number of highly rendered, haunting and particularly memorable images, exposing various aspects of the evils of Nazi ideology. 
So it probably came as no surprise to him that following these less than flattering images, both he and the magazine were driven underground for fear of execution when Holland was invaded in 1940. Despite the danger he was in, he remained a thorn in the Nazi's side throughout the war and lived to tell the tale. And it's this series of potent graphic condemnations which continues to be his greatest legacy. Once the war ended, he increasingly turned to film criticism, a parallel career he'd sustained throughout his adult life. And although he did continue to create some political work, he never recaptured the dark poetry of his wartime achievements. He eventually retired in 1961, and Leo Jordan died in Zelhem in 1980 at the age of 95. British poster artist Tom Purvis was born in Bristol in 1888, and when old enough he studied art at Camberwell Art School in London. Following his art education, he worked in an advertising agency for six years before volunteering for the army to fight in the First World War. He also created some posters for the Red Cross at this time, but these images gave no indication whatsoever of the illustrator he would become. After the war, he began a freelance career in magazine and poster work, all of which demonstrated a remarkably diverse collection of styles. The visual evidence suggests that at this stage he was either unsure of a graphic direction or was perfectly happy to style hop from commission to commission. Among these styles was a flat posterised technique and it was this style he used on his first poster for the London and North Eastern Railway in 1923. I'm sure many watching this will have noticed that his work for this client bears a remarkable similarity to the work of Frank Newbold, which featured in Unsung Hero 64. Both men were the same age and had been both influenced by the same early poster artists. And to make it even harder to tell them apart, both worked for the LNER and shared equal prominence in the posters produced. Like Newbold, Purvis was paid a retainer and travelled the routes at the company's expense to record the scenery and activities of holiday makers. The images Purvis produced for the LNER over a 20 year period were all created in varying levels of posterisation and they range from close quarter depictions of individuals and groups making the most of the beaches and freezing waters of the British seaside through to breathtaking and dramatically scenic images of the countryside which picked up on the tranquil aesthetically pleasing compositions of Japanese prints. Purvis also produced some posters for the railway that could either stand alone or be joined to produce a single overall image. The East Coast Joyce set, which depicted various leisure activities, was cleverly constructed to be visually compelling in both formats. And just like Newbold, Purvis occasionally pushed very hard at the acceptable boundaries of colour palettes, with some distinctive results. I have no evidence, but I get the feeling they were very much competing with each other. Over a similar time span, Purvis also designed a series of posters for the gentleman's outfit as Austin Reed. These images were the very definition of male elegance for the more affluent gent about town, and Purvis's strong design sense produced posters which incorporated typography and illustration with perfect balance and restraint. And with this body of work, he appears to have been quite at home creating both heavily posterised and more naturalistic tonal illustrations. This return to diverse techniques featured elsewhere in his later output for other clients, among these were posters and publicity for Shell Oil and some lightly posterised demure pinups for Canadian Pacific. During the Second World War he was commissioned to produce domestic propaganda, most of which was also resolutely painterly, and by the time the war had ended, Purvis had stopped creating commercial work either for the LNER or anyone else. And from that point on he worked as an artist, most frequently creating portraits, up to his death at the age of 69 in 1957. The highly distinctive cartoonist Basil Wolverton was born in 1909 in Central Point, Oregon. Information about the early stages of his life and career are patchy at best, but it's known that in 1929, when he was still only 20, he created his first comic strip, Marco of Mars. 
Despite its manifestly unresolved technique, it was accepted for syndication, but never actually published. Following this setback, evidence of his work becomes thin on the ground, and some sources assert that during this period he also worked as a reporter for the Portland News. But in 1938, his humorous strip Disguise the Detective was published in Circus Comics. And more significantly, in 1940, the superhero science fiction strip Space Hawk made its debut in Target Comics and ran for 30 episodes until 1942. Both these projects reveal that Wolverton's style was both idiosyncratic and distinctive, favouring stippling techniques and an unusual and highly imaginative approach to character design. Although the strips were printed in colour, it was added at printing to his monochrome pen and ink originals. Having finally achieved a foothold in the world of comic art, he entered a particularly prolific phase and created many more with widely varying degrees of success in the coming decades. Some of these were humorous and others more serious-minded science fiction or horror tales, but all of them bore little resemblance to the work of any of his contemporaries, and all were possessed of a manic energy and unconventional graphic appeal. Among his most successful creations was Powerhouse Pepper, about a dim-witted boxer, which appeared in various comic books between 1942 and 1952. And at this time, Wolberton was also churning out a large number of other madcap characters and took an obvious enjoyment in their frequently alliterative naming. In 1941, Wolverton became a follower of Herbert W. Armstrong's Radio Church of God, and in the early 50s, Armstrong commissioned him to create a set of biblical images based on the prophecies from the Book of Revelation for publication in the church's Plain Truth magazine. This series of around 20 illustrations were first published in 1954, and they are some of Wolverton's technically finest drawings. Certainly they remain his most dramatic and disturbing. Despite his religious affiliations, he continued to create secular, more humorous work, and in the mid-1950s, his insane inventions featured in the pages of the usually serious-minded Life magazine. And at the same time, he began to feature in Mad magazine. This should have been a match made in heaven, but he never became a regular contributor, and had only nine published pieces in over a decade. In 1958, he also started appearing in Mad's rival magazine, Cracked, and both his humorous grotesqueries and weird fantasy work continue to feature in various American comic books. During the 1960s, he had great success with various series of Topps trading cards, featuring a seamlessly endless line of distorted and inventive comic characters. Among other later projects, he created a series of covers for the satirical magazine Plop. And Basil Wolverton died in 1978 at the age of 69. And that's the end of this instalment, so I hope you'll be back for more soon.